hi everyone. It's right at noon right now. And so um, I'm going to open up this lecture uh, because we will all be um, interested in getting a kind of discussion in at the end before studio. I offered to introduce our speaker, Gary Bates from Spaceman Group, and he suggested that he do the introduction himself, which I think is a great idea. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our lecturer, Gary Bates. All right, great, let's see. Um, sound okay? Sounds great. Great, all right. Uh, this is a totally new format for me, so it's a bit uh, strange. I'm very curious who uh, Ewan Dai is. I hope uh, that is actually a person from another planet, um, uh, it looks like in the, in the pictures. Uh, a bit strange to, uh, to communicate with you, but I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is Gary. I'm an architect and the founder of Space Group. Uh, Space Group was founded in 1999. Uh, my background, I'm from a small city in the U.S. Uh, Wilmington, Delaware, uh, a very tumultuous place to grow up. Uh, uh, unfortunately, despite that, I moved to the suburbs and became a kind of product of the suburbs. Uh, subsequently, leaving um, Delaware and studying architecture at Virginia Tech, I understood, let's say, already at a young age, I mean, I was very much focused on sports. I thought that I was going to be a professional athlete until one day I suffered a traumatic injury. Uh, which meant that was not going to happen. Uh, I remember very specifically uh, calling my father and telling him about my dramatic injury and that I was going to drop out of architecture school, uh, at which point he said that was fine, um, but I could not come back to his house ever again. Uh, so I decided uh, that I would continue with architecture school despite uh, having to clean bricks for a living to actually be able to pay for architecture school. Um, that was uh, a very good uh, experience. The school was uh, the school was kind of uh, fantastic, and I was fortunate to I was fortunate to go into a parallel line in that school, a parallel kind of study, which was much more uh, much more theoretical, uh, much more abstract, uh, which was for me a very good starting point. Already, I think at the age of twelve, I knew I wanted to be an architect. I submitted a bunch of sketches to a teacher and proclaimed I wanted to be an architect, and I still have that sketchbook. Uh, I left uh, the university uh, and decided to become a photographer, uh, since I was working in uh, in, in media and silkscreen photography and and other uh, related medias. Uh, I did that for one year. I managed a jazz club and decided I would never become an architect. Uh, at some point, I did become an architect, uh, but I only did it under one condition, and that was I jumped on a plane. I flew to Berlin. It was 1991. I went to the office of Daniel Liebeskin, stood in his lobby, and said, I want a job. The office manager came by and said, get the fuck out of here. Um, I waited. His wife, or I guess we can curse on Zoom, right? I waited. Uh, his wife uh, came by and said, who are you? I said, I'm Gary. She goes, can we see your portfolio? And I said, no. She said, why? I said, because it's the only document I have. It's my entire life. All the photographs are handmade. I don't have any copies. You can't have it. She goes, just let me have it till tomorrow morning and I'll call you. Apparently when I left, she took everyone in the office in the meeting room, spread my portfolio out on the table. They all came and dove through it. She called me at seven o'clock in the morning the next day and offered me a job. And I started working at Daniel Liebeskin on the, on the Berlin Museum. It lasted for one year until Daniel and I nearly kill each other, at which point I left on a friend's advice to go work for Rem Kohlhaas. Now, I was such a nerd and a geek and a theoretician and an artist that I actually had never heard of Rem Kohlhaas. I have to admit, I never told anyone that before. My friend suggested I go there. It was 1992. There were 25 people I interviewed with Rem. Rem said about 15 times during the meeting. First of all, I called Rem and said, hi, my name's Gary. Can I speak to Rem? The secretary was so shocked, she assumed I knew him, so he got on the phone, uh, at which point I had a direct conversation with Rem. He invited me to come to the office. I went on the same day on the train, uh, went there. Um, the entire conversation, we were speaking at the same time. He didn't hear a word I said. I didn't hear a word he said, at which point he offered me a job despite not having any work, um, So, which is really cool. And I started working there, and after the first week at his office, he offered me the Educatorium Project together with Jakob Van Rijs, the VR from MBRDV. 
and that's how the story goes. I led the I led the Asian desk at his uh, office and became a director. Um, and then after the crash in '98, decided to leave uh, and moved uh, to Norway. Um, the move to Norway was mostly to get out of the shadow. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, you can ask me afterwards. So that was my introduction of who I am and how I got to where I am now. I'm gonna to try to share my screen uh, and see if it works. Uh, let me see, share computer sounds here, okay. Let's share everything. Um, we have some notes there as well. Uh, give me one second. Okay, hold on one second here. Okay, uh, actually I have no idea what I'm doing, so. Hey Guru, you don't have to help me, it's fine. My partner who's watching in the other room in a state of panic ran into the room to help me uh, uh, explain how to use Zoom because she's a professor at the university, I'm not. Um, but wait a second, I just wanna share screen and see my notes. I don't remember how we did that yesterday, sorry. I don't lecture in this format. Um, use presenter view. Hey Guru, you're allowed to walk in. I'm not such a nerd. If you want to show me how to do it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, all right. Okay, well, then we won't do it like that. Yes. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. It worked so perfectly yesterday. I know, you made it look so easy yesterday. Well, I had you there yesterday. Now you <laughs> seem to not be there. I didn't even think it was possible to, sh to do notes and PowerPoint at the same time, but you guys figured it out yesterday, Amber? Actually, he figured it out. Oh, yeah? Um, he was like, yeah, and he just pushed one button, and I was like, okay. Because I was going okay, to go hold on one second. I'm going to do it again because you inspired me. Um, one second here. Um, it's always the same with this. Uh, that's why I refuse to do it. No. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, we'll just start. Uh, I'll share my screen again, and it's not going to work like I wanted it to, but that's fine. I'm sure it's going to be great. Off the top is always kind of nice. Yeah, I agree. Let me just get you guys back here again. Sorry for that. Uh, it worked so well yesterday, I have to say. Um, where do I share my screen? There. One button. And then you'll pick a second one where you actually pick. Yeah, you I'm good. And All right, cool. So uh, we'll take it from there. So this, um, I just always have to keep my, uh, watch my office while I'm, uh, while I'm uh, working. 
The, um, this is just a picture uh, inside my office with a model of the uh, Oslo S in the background there. We've, um, let's say, I started to write a book um, in, and Michael begged me not to talk about it, so I'll try not to talk too much about the book, but it was, you know, essentially after 20 years, we were collecting information and looking at where the profession was going. And about four years ago, we decided to consider a new direction for the profession, um, not out of, uh, let's say, out of a kind of whimsical uh, fascination, but frankly, we were just seeing a dramatic change in the way that we were working. And that dramatic change was in part, um, we were increasingly kind of relegated to uh, a limited part of the designs. So we were increasingly relegated to, to new facade design, but there was a formulaic approach that was kind of given to us that uh, dealt with the building, the building mass, the program, the siting of the building, the landscape of the building, um, the, the quantums of the building, uh, the functions of the building, the techniques of the building, let's say the technical performance of the building. And in one moment, as that uh, pro forma got kind of bigger and bigger, we were relegated to a smaller and smaller piece of the intelligence that we felt that we would be able to contribute. Um, that was a bit of a kind of disappointment uh, for us, uh, naturally. And we started to kind of rethink the profession. Uh, the first uh, article, uh, or the first, uh, let's say, part of the manifesto, and the title of the lecture, Space Man, comes from the book, the title of the book. The man with a period at the end stands for manifesto, a kind of shortened version of a manifesto a kind of projective manifesto that we're working on. And it really tries to outline where we think the profession is going or the profession can go, um, and one in which looks at an optimal kind of uh, positioning for the architect. But this is a kind of diagram showing what we were, let's say, increasingly confronted with. Um, and it meant the typical linear process uh, where we were involved, uh, where 90% of the critical decisions have already been made but realizing the greatest value that we could add was getting lost. So I'm not sure, oh wait, there was a way that you could, uh, can you see my uh, pointer? Yeah, we can see yeah. it. You do, okay, yeah. So this is where we are as, as kind of architects and on this side of the kind of line, let's say it's, uh, we, you know, we're, we're usually to the right side of this line where we have regulation, design, construction, but everything related to the site, the property development, um, the research, uh, public relations, the due diligence, the investors, the financing and everything happened before we often come on the board. And then we do uh, things related to regulation, planning, design and construction. And we wanted to get onto the other side of that line. So we started to do a number of projects that kind of pushed us over to that other side and started making those links directly to the developer, directly to the public, uh, let's say to all the different public officials and politicians and investment, et cetera. And that's where we felt <coughs> And that's what we call deep um, as a kind of, which became the first iteration of our kind of redesigning the office. Um, what it essentially allowed us to do is it, uh, you know, allowed us to go into projects and we would a lot of times do this work on a kind of no cure, no pay basis and say, you know, we want to join the process at a much earlier stage where we can add information re regarding programming, regarding uh, the functionality of the building regarding new technology regarding environmental performance and things and things that were often uh, already um, decided before we came in the picture so i've broken in the lecture into a few different parts i have excluded a few parts because michael promised me there would be future lessons uh, lectures but the last time he invited me was uh, five years ago so i'm seriously dubious that's the case i'll talk about a few of our buildings and try to relate back to this uh, to this brief uh, introduction about where we see and the profession going and maybe we can have a conversation about that at the end and again let's say let's say there's also a book coming out that's uh, talking specifically about that and uh, and and laying out uh, new directions um the first building i'll talk uh, briefly about i have a, a lot of uh, information i want to show you um, mostly because i don't think i'll ever be invited again so the first is the Oslo central station um, a project that you may have seen um, this is the uh, this is the opera building uh, here, uh, which many of you uh, probably know. Um, as you see, Oslo is a relatively kind of low rise, uh, low dense, uh, a green city. And on the waterfront is the central station. The central station, like many central stations, has, uh, has gone through uh, an evolution of development and growth, at which point this beautiful photograph becomes this. This is the reality. This is the original station building. 
Um, this is the sprawl, including a shopping center, an additional hall added to the building, an additional extension, several extensions to the existing building, um, several buildings built on top of the station, uh, new hotels, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and this is a reality that we see a lot of uh, infrastructural buildings uh, being kind of confronted with um, and an inability with this uh, kind of sprawl and growth to, to actually have um, a clear, uh, let's say a clear uh, identity. This is the original hall. Identity was pretty clear, beautiful structure. The trains came right into this uh, space. Uh, you boarded directly, uh, and that was all there was uh, when the station was first built. Um, we see from 1854, where we saw that previous photograph, and as that station uh, kind of developed uh, and started to wrap around the tracks, um, then uh, this uh, high-rise uh, building came into place here in the, in the 70s. We see here in the 80s that they uh, build a tunnel to continue the tracks to the west side of the city. Um, then the central hall building, which was that brown um, building in the front, was built on top of that tunnel. You see the airport train, uh, which is built uh, there, um, but no longer in use. Um, this is the uh, shopping center on the corner and the hotel that I pointed out in the slide before. So this is the kind of uh, growth until 2000. Now, originally what you had is you walked into the station, the trains were there, you got on your train and left. This is the reality today. So we've gone from a situation like this with an immediate uh, relationship to the trains to a situation like this, where you have to walk through a kind of labyrinth of spaces, commercials, uh, hot dog stands, uh, newspaper stands, uh, et cetera, to get to, to get to where you want to go. And there is no option. Um, our, uh, our treatment of that through uh, a ton of uh, investigations uh, was to look at how we could bring such a proximity uh, back again and offer, uh, and offer a new reading of the station. So one of the things that kind of uh, predicated that was an understanding that the original movements in the city were largely from west to east. Uh, moving across, and you see this uh, horizontal axis, but the research that we uh, kind of found is that the future of the station would be moving from north to south. Um, that comes from where housing is being located and how the population has shifted from the west side to the east side of the city and, and the boom that's happened there, and understanding uh, the flows which we were able to analyze in the city, which gave us a, uh, a very strong starting point for the design. That starting point, which you see here in this, uh, in this diagram, uh, plan diagram, is a cut that we were able to make through all of the existing building mass between different property owners uh, and between existing small structures that, exist, that, are, uh, that are there today. And to be able to make a clear cut from north to south, the south being the opera, uh, the north being the, the development on the east side of the city there. And to be able to make that clear cut as an unadulterated, non-commercialized, connection through the whole city. That gave incredible access that doesn't exist because of the trains are blocking the rest of the city to the east. But it also allowed us to say, you know, leave this uh, completely free, but we can always tap into, this is where the old um, airport train was. We can build on top of that. Here we can connect to the old station and they were planning to renovate it with a hotel and commercial facilities. Here we'll demolish the building here that is out of date build a new building, create two public spaces of a usable size, and, uh, and we would be able to connect directly to these commercial spaces. So it also would become a spine at the same time. So what you start to get in this kind of new uh, iteration of the station is the spine that cuts through, creates one type of public space, and then a number of public spaces that you see in comparison with the other public spaces in the neighborhood to start to have a similar size and scale um, and, and giving them uh, different options. And a lot of our work is actually concentrated, concentrated on uh, the urban and always starts with the uh, urban plan. And in this case, you see, uh, let's say, an attention to access and pedestrian movement and a liberation of space. And what's interesting is, uh, in a case like this, our, our competition entry was the smallest competition entry, square meter wise, but we take our projects both from the urban and let's say social equity side, if I can call it that, all the way through to, to the business case side. And our business case, despite being the smallest number of square meters that they were getting from any other project, 
are, uh, it was also the greatest return on their investment because of the way that we programmed it, uh, because um, of the, uh, let's say, the, the efficiency that the design had. And we were able to prove that. So we were able to technically prove it, and that technical, technically proving it um, is related to the structure, which I'll show you in a minute. We're able to economically prove it, and we're able to create a socially equitable space. So the first building is the station. Um, incredibly difficult to build because of the train tracks below. We had to make a building, or we have to make a building. The project is ongoing. We had to make a building that would reuse all of the existing foundations in the tunnels and parking garages and infrastructure underneath the ground. The station had to be operative 100% of the time. So our design uh, had those uh, almost impossible starting points. Um, this is just an analysis of the flow. Uh, what this is showing on the left side of the screen is the flow um, as it was, uh, let's say, the flow diagram and looking at the kind of bottlenecks and how we could kind of resolve that in this flow where blue is, the, is uh, let's say, the ideal condition looking at peak times of, of travel. There's about 50 million passengers that move through the station uh, currently every year. This is a section then through that center of the building and you can start to kind of understand um, the series of arches and the access from, uh, from north to south as we move through it, a 300 meter long uh, access with offices built above it. Um, those offices uh, finance the building and construction of the station below. All of that is, uh, as you see in the diagram there, kind of parametrically modeled so that we can control the loading points and shift those and uh, immediately understand the cause and effect of what's happening to our steel structure um, and how we're landing on the existing foundations, particularly where the tunnel is in the center part. So those are some of the study models that uh, were made uh, to do that. And again, the kind of uh, parametric models where we start to tweak the length of spans, start to tweak the thickness of the steel uh, to see, uh, to get the optimal uh, relationship between uh, strength, uh, openness, uh, and span. Um, yeah. So a few uh, images. This is how the station looks today. This is uh, the entrance uh, is not on the ground on the street level, which means the entire street level um, has no accessibility. And they built bridges because of the amount of cars on the road uh, on the north side of the station. That for us was a kind of unacceptable uh, situation. So we proposed to demolish the bridges and we proposed to make a direct access from the north, which will be the future, uh, the, the main, uh, the, the majority of people will be coming from. The next is what's called Fjordporten. These uh, two office buildings, they were built on top of the, uh, or the location of the former uh, airport train terminal, which uh, which terminated there. And uh, as that is no longer uh, in use, and as that site is kind of retracted from all, uh, let's say, primary site lines, um, we're, we're able to, uh, we're able to build, and, and currently it's, uh, it's uh, moving ahead there, to build a taller structure on that site, again, um, helping to create a financial model that was uh, profitable for the client. Now, Carl Johan is the main street that goes from the station uh, all the way to the, uh, the castle, um, being an important axis. And on the top right, you see that image. So that uh, cut that happens in the building is, is preserving the view to the mountains in the background as you look down this main commercial artery um, from the castle. These are kind of a uh, few simulations of the project kind of before uh, currently as it is today. This is the, uh, this is the kind of uh, what you're confronted with, kind of 7-Eleven uh, shopping, uh, grab and go, uh, et cetera. This is the future condition uh, related to the public space on the outside. Believe it or not, that's the same uh, angle. These, uh, again, the current condition and the future condition, the current condition, and future condition. This is now looking out towards the trains. Uh, the current condition from the old building side. So now we're standing, let's say, close to the opera, looking to the north. And this is the future condition where that axis comes out and now is an exterior covered space 
um, adjacent to this uh, main square. And this is the front side, uh, current condition. Um, the tunnel is going below here where the trains now are moving towards the west. Uh, and this is the future condition. And uh, importance is that now we're able to bring the pedestrian flow back to street level, bring people fluidly into the building uh, and create a public space in front of the building so that you can actually uh, walk outside. Ironically enough, when I first came to Norway, everyone believed it was not possible to walk outside. We recently completed the renovation of the main, uh, say one of the main shopping uh, centers in the center of the city, uh, where we got rid of all bridges, where we got rid of the shopping mall, where we made everything street shopping um, and changed the whole paradigm about how they use that part of the city. And it is now proven to be the most successful uh, commercial development in the country. So those changes, uh, in particular here, giving the street back to, back to uh, the pedestrian uh, is something that you'll see recurring in the other projects I'm going to show you as well. So this is just a, a model of the project to give you uh, an overview of the, of the three main buildings, the station, uh, the tower, and then the kind of building here on the front, the crystal, we call it. Um, the second project I'm going to show you uh, is in Azerbaijan. Uh, it is a, um, we were asked and we've been working for some time now in Azerbaijan and this is a central market uh, that we were asked to look at. A kind of difficult uh, project, the bazaar is such a unique uh, program um, in that part of the world and they have a relationship uh, to, let's say, Turkish bazaars. Uh, Baku is also not that far from uh, Iran. Uh, which has a tradition of kind of bazaar, bazaars and markets. And so it was something that kind of we uh, delved quite deeply into to understand the kind of dynamics of how it's working, the dynamics of trade. Um, and let's say similar to the previous project, also trying to understand uh, territorialization of space and the democratization of space. Um, here we see the development of it. Um, it was originally a part of the city that was for uh, for laying brick uh, for making bricks. Uh, it was largely uh, industrial. Um, then it became uh, what was known as an incredibly uh, dangerous kind of neighborhood because around those factories then were developing uh, low income housing. That low income housing became, uh, let's say, flashpoint for, uh, let's say, a lot of. Uh, uh, devious behavior at that time. So it was kind of a walled off zone where the police wouldn't enter, uh, a bit uh, like a favela in Brazil, and um, which was just to the south of our project. This is the in the 40s as the development now is spread uh, fully into this time. This was taken just after World War II. Um, in 1957, the market was established on this point. This is the main axis going all the way down to the waterfront of Baku. I think we can see it here again. So there's here, and that was this axis going down to the waterfront and the bay of Baku. And on the right side, now we see uh, the kind of unfortunate, um, kind of promiscuous development of high rise, uh, fairly sterile construction, uh, residential construction, um, raising the kind of value. So what we see now is an axis with fairly expensive. Uh, Fair, uh, fairly expensive uh, high-rise housing, and then this neighborhood where you see this uh, dense uh, fabric uh, on the uh, south side of the site. This is an aerial photograph of the uh, existing market. Here you can see the high-rise development. The market is kind of made up of a, basically a series of shed buildings. Those sheds are, um, it's, it's kind of a, uh, let's say each, shop owner or group of shop owners has kind of created a construction for himself. So it's a combination of indoor and outdoor spaces, primarily outdoor spaces. There's a few buildings that are standing on the site, one building where they have fish and meat, one building where they have offices and a few smaller structures uh, existing on the site um, and a group of trees that you see here. Uh, the site uh, is, well, it looks like this. So here you see the combination of metal roof, lightweight structure, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, part of the market, uh, dirt floor. Um, so a real hybrid of, uh, of construction. We have kind of uh, cement block buildings, 
uh, steel structures, uh, etc. This is the existing functions in it. Uh, there, uh, it's if I remember correctly, here there was live uh, animals where you could buy uh, fresh chickens. Here you had wild and weird animals. In fact, um, in these areas here, here's where the fruit market was that you saw the fruit and vegetable markets. These are all the spices. Um, one of the one of the most challenging things with the design is that from the top left corner to the bottom right corner here is a 17 meter uh, height uh, difference. Um, 17 meters is, yeah, I, I, I hope you all know metrics. Uh, I'm not able to convert right now, but it's uh, essentially a five story building from the top corner to the bottom corner. Um, these are all very small scale um, low quality housing, which, uh, which we fought to keep uh, on the site. And they wanted to demolish everything. Um, and so this is where we're starting. The primary access is from here. There's a secondary access. And essentially there is a route that you can make, which brings you through the entire market without uh, necessarily needing to use stairs um, as it steps down, as I said, uh, these 17 meters. It is possible to move through the whole thing, which in, in itself I found very fascinating. Some of the pictures from the inside of the space, um, beautiful colors, obviously um, a very chaotic uh, experience. And one of the things we started to look at uh, were different bazaars. This is the, the, the Bursa Bazaar in uh, Istanbul. And what I found incredibly fascinating and going back to the uh, OMA days, one of the things that we're always looking at, number one, was the Noli uh, plan, which, uh, which you may know or should uh, know and check out um, for, uh, for Rome and uh, the map. And as well, we we're always looking at uh, Pompeii and, uh, and studying those. And in a lot of the old, old collages in Ome, you'll find kind of remnants of that. When you look at the Bursa Bazaar, there's kind of interesting kind of almost inversion to how we see shopping and creating these large public spaces where the shopping then is around the perimeter and you get double-sided, meaning accessibility from two sides. You, you can come in the middle and have accessibility only from the center of the space. And you'll see these differences, which we really started to break down into typologies. Here you see uh, Tehran Bazaar, the Aleppo, uh, Souk, uh, the Roman Forum, as I mentioned, the Greek Agora, and, and many of them having similar uh, conditions, either being network uh, or being a, an accumulation of, uh, of, uh, of courtyards, let's call them. So here you see the kind of uh, analysis that we kind of broke down these different types. We created these 10 different types of courtyard spaces. And I think it was really kind of uh, complex for our client because we started to de we started to de uh, design the negative space before we designed the kind of positive space. So we started to look at um, how we could organize a series of public spaces. And the main reason for doing that was to address the serious uh, differences um, in in terms of the population groups that were living in that area and saying it was as important for me if this was going to be continue to be a part of the city that it would be a low threshold space with accessibility for everyone if you just want to come and sit you want to come and read the newspaper that would be possible and we wouldn't create a kind of shopping mall condition which the owners were pushing for so here you see these different types i think they're understandable here's a single entrance into a space here you get a four-sided courtyard uh, here you get courtyard inside and outside. And so we analyzed those. We tested these out in relationship to the different functions that we were provided, breaking them down also knowing the functions that were already in the market. And the intention was to keep the predominant uh, number of operators there um, in the new building. And we made this uh, sketch, um, which is, uh, let's say, a translation of those typologies into the footprint that we had. Now, this is just a diagram of that. Brings me to this, and I guess this is what I mean by the difference. This you all know, uh, a beautiful building, uh, ironically enough, by uh, my friend who I mentioned earlier, our friends at uh, MVRDV. And let's say the, uh, the bazaar that we see in Iran, and we opted, let's say, to kind of look at this traditional typology and see how that traditional typology could become part of our design. And then you would get uh, these kind of spaces. 
I don't have time to go into the details. These are the plans. Um, they insisted on a parking uh, garage under the building. Um, I insisted not to have it, but we are, that's still kind of uh, being negotiated. Uh, and as we move through the building, one of the things that became important for me was that we maintained this, these terraces and level differences that were there and allowed a kind of fluid movement through the space uh, without kind of disrupting the uh, natural landscape condition that was there. So we, let's say, are maintaining that in design. These are the, let's say, some flow diagrams. Um, what's interesting, if you can see the annotation there, that each color represents a different type of user how long they would travel to get to it. And we did a whole series of these kind of studies, breaking it down user by user and saying, you know, a mother is coming to do her, do her weekly shopping or someone is coming to have lunch or to buy their bread or someone who's just uh, only going for fish and meat, uh, et cetera, and breaking it down into terms of different users um, and day and nighttime as well. And we did a whole series of these kind of studies. This is a, a, a collage of some of those uh, results. Um, so the plan uh, looks like this. The blue are the public spaces that you saw, which we put the majority of our attention on. And then the other spaces then become the colored spaces that you see here, which are each one of the different facilities that they have, the tea rooms, the wine tasting, the, um, the meat and fish, which become a spine here on the back where we need cold rooms or, or climatized rooms, reusing that existing building that I pointed out. Uh, and a balcony here um, for restaurants uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and a, a kind of private uh, zone uh, looking out over the market itself. The section of the building, um, one of the interesting features of the building is the roof we designed with uh, Adams Carrot Taylor out of London. Um, we wanted to have a kind of, uh, let's say, a fairly large span in the roof in order to create this openness that there is uh, there today. Um, the span uh, that you see uh, that you see here and one and in addition to that we wanted to also um, number one we wanted to create a roof using a using a wooden structure we created a hybrid wooden structure which I'll show you and also to have a roof that was open. Now the climate there is very warm in the summer uh, moderate in the winter, it never gets super cold, but for them it's insanely cold. For us here in Norway, it's not cold at all. Um, and the roof is oriented in a way based on the analysis of the wind and rain, etc., in order to promote a natural ventilation. So we're getting something uh, similar to this. This is an exceptional piece of the roof, exceptional meaning the rest of the roof is not like that. The rest of the roof is a, is a hybrid structure using, uh, using uh, laminate wood. Uh, wood beams uh, and uh, a combination of wood and steel in a vaulted structure. Um, some of the materials from the city that you see and studying different types of vaults that they had, studying uh, the different uses of uh, limestone that they have in the city, and then looking at our facades. Uh, and here we're looking, just to go back for a minute, at different porosities, how they create windows, how they create sunscreening. Here you see sunscreening in the, in the facades. And, uh, and to bring that into the building. Now we're using um, a stone coursing that gives us perforated open areas, that gives us perforated areas with glass behind, that gives us recess in order, in order to give us depth and detailing. And so we really, let's say, are going in and designing those uh, aspects to keep the kind of, um, both the, the decorative, but also functional aspects and promoting this idea also of, um, of different climate conditions in the building. So you see some of the facades here and here. Uh, this, these are some of the details about how the, how the facade works and a view uh, of some of those spaces. Now here, just quickly, you see uh, on the right side, well, the idea, this is a, this is a reference, a painting from, uh, from Lucio Fontana, uh, who did these beautiful cut canvas paintings. And on the right side, you see the buildup of the roof, um, which is a kind of a combination uh, structure uh, using uh, steel wood, uh, secondary wood, uh, wood laminate, which gives a stiffness. Um, so 
some of our studies for that roof. Lastly, about this is the environmental design. Uh, here we are creating a couple of different things uh, besides the collecting of rainwater uh, in order to use. There's obviously a lot of washing and uh, a lot of water needed in this facility. We're using something called anaerobic digestion. If you don't know about it, I recommend you checking it out. It's a great form of creating energy by using, uh, it's a passive way of using uh, waste food to create gas, which can be used for heating, cooking, etc. We are able with our food waste, um, both from restaurants and from the market, to produce 70 or 75 percent of the entire energy demand of the building, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, this is also something very difficult for them to grasp, but we're creating um, we're creating not one climate zone, which would be the shopping mall, but we're creating seven climate zones, which go from just shaded to shaded with some air movement, to shaded with exhaust air, to local heat, meaning heat that's kind of coming off of another space, to semi-heated for frost protection, to fully heated and fully heated and cooled when we have perishable products and things like that, and organizing the space. And this is just a quick uh, diagram of how the anaerobic digestion system works. So. That is uh, the second project I wanted to show you. I'll show you one more project. I understand a lot of you are going to disappear. Uh, I had more to show you, but I'll show you one more and then leave some time that we can still talk. Uh, unless you're enjoying yourselves and then I might continue. Um, this is a project in Tromsø. Really fascinating uh, sound. It's in the polar circle. It's in the north of Norway. It's 24 hours of darkness in the winter, uh, 24 hours of light in the summer. Uh, this is a view from the site. It was a competition uh, for a new uh, ferry terminal, uh, bus terminal, speedboat terminal uh, with, uh, in the competition together with Zaha Did, uh, Foreign Office Architects, and MVRDV. This is the existing uh, site before uh, landfill, uh, where one of the kind of ferry boats, and this is a specific to Norway, a kind of coastal steam liner that brings both goods uh, people and, ca and cars uh, to from city to city. A lot of these cities don't have alternative uh, transport as you get further and further north. So this is a really important um, form of transportation. Um, this, by the way, is the old city. This is the old uh, historical church and the main kind of shopping street. The city, the city is a collage of different uh, uh, architectures from small fairly beautiful wooden structures to, uh, to brutalist concrete structures to industrial, uh, let's say, uh, warehouse buildings for, uh, for, for different sea-related uh, different sea-related uh, industries uh, to quite uh, horrible shopping centers all in the center of the city. Um, so the beautiful, the beauty that you see here is lost here. Um, this is a building that's looking like books falling over. Um, these are some uh, new um, offices in the background you see there. This is the shopping uh, center. Uh, this is a fairly beautiful, despite the sign, uh, old, very old uh, restaurant. Um, and here we are just at the beginning of the site. This image is the main image, uh, let's say, that kind of inspired us. I was uh, up in Tromsø. Uh, the temperatures, uh, just to describe what we're looking at, this is the main street. You see cars driving by in both directions here. Um, the small two-story, three-story wooden structures. Um, the people are crossing the street uh, from both sides of the street. They meet in the middle. Uh, the woman uh, happens to be breastfeeding and uh, pushing a baby stroller with cars driving on the outside. What this image did when we were there and kind of walking the neighborhood uh, to understand the city was to understand that these people have a completely different understanding of public space. Um, their understanding of public space is one based on territorialization and they own the public space, not the cars. Um, uh, and that uh, for me was incredibly fascinating and became a key point in starting, uh, in starting the design how we would shift this uh, priority to, um, to, to that space. And what differentiated our competition entry 
from all the other competition entries is that all the co other competition entries made large monolithic buildings. And our project, again, started by uh, developing and designing the public space and allowing the, the architecture to form itself around the public space. Uh, and I think that was a, a radically different uh, case, but what it also did was it gave them, uh, number one, we exacerbated the facades by this splitting. That exacerbation meant that they could run different business models. Uh, at the same time, we brought the street level into the building, uh, which allowed the pedestrians to reach the waterfront, even on the second level. These are some of our study models, so you can see how rough it was. We even did a hotel on the site adjacent to it. Um, and starting with this paper model, looking at the flows and tucking the architecture under this landscape. So we really began by a folding, lifting, peeling of the landscape to understand where do we, you know, we couldn't do a kind of Miesian modernistic, or excuse me, Corbusian modernistic approach to a landscape where you kind of lift the building above the landscape, make a window and frame a view. Here, the view was kind of centripetal. You have layer upon layer of mountains and sea. We're standing on an island. So there is no front side, there is no back side. And that absence of front side and back side, and that, um, and our objective to focus on the people and not this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, fairly, I think, limp objectification of nature gave us a, a different strategy uh, for, for, for the architectural development. So these are some of the study models where we start to uh, push more and more uh, architecture into the landscape, where the landscape is still the, the primary focus. Um, I just showed this, uh, I just showed this to you to explain one thing. Um, this is upon winning the competition. Uh, if you haven't guessed, the guy on the right, he's, uh, he's the one who's going to own this building. He's very happy. Uh, the, um, this is my partner who was running in and out of the room worried about my presentation skills uh, using this format. This is the other partner at that time who is totally scared of how we're going to possibly build this thing. And this is the mayor of the city um, who has no idea what just happened. Um, so this is the site after the snow comes back to the image of the, of the woman breastfeeding in the middle of the street talking to her friends. When the snow comes, there are no streets, there are no sidewalks, there are no parks, there are only buildings standing in a white field. And that becomes incredibly fascinating. This is the site where we will be developing and filling it. But that also is part of the reason. And when it comes, it stays for five months straight and you have a completely different reading of the space. And the space becomes the area between the buildings and you haven't broken it up into different lanes of traffic and ownership. The ownership becomes flattened. The people take over the public space. So here's our building pulled back from the first public space with the view uh, to the mountains in one direction. Um, you see the landscape is moving up into the building, creating a new datum for the building. The reason for that new datum is all the cargo functions, the bus functions are then tucked under that datum and it allows them instead of being uh, blocks permitting people from reaching uh, the waterfront, it actually were able to lift the landscape uh, on top of them. And that's this black line that you'll see running around the entire building. That's this new datum which uh, rests on. So, and uh, the extension of the main street, the view from the church through the project to the boat in the background. And here you see this, uh, this fragmented uh, approach, which gives us connectability through this datum between all the different functions, but also gives us autonomy of these functions where each one can work and operate on its own time frame uh, and uh, be programmed uh, differently um, without uh, negatively impacting each other. The view from the city, which we wanted to kind of protect, the lifting of the landscape and entering on the second level, the view from the boat, uh, looking down, there's a courtyard in the middle, and what you'll notice actually is this facade is gold. This one facade of this building is golden, and then one facade here of this building is golden, creating an inner courtyard, which unless you're standing where these people are standing, then you'll be standing in a kind of golden colored courtyard. This goes to some of our ideas about articulation of, uh, 
of textures and details, and materialization, and creating identity in public space. Here you also see a texture um, on the concrete, prefabricated panels with a texture like a curtain, which you see from a distance like this, but then from across the water you don't see. Um, and three different textures happening here in terms of the metal and the metal profiling uh, recess, uh, creating light and shadow. These were the facades. The diagram here we called centripetal mies. Uh, I won't try to explain what that means. Here is a view from uh, the third building, looking back towards the main terminal building and the office building. A view out to the water. Uh, these were not part of our original design, but uh, in, as I told you about public space, people will drive anywhere, park anywhere, own anything. Um, so they put those up after the design to block cars from driving all over the public space. A view to the buses down below, a view to the famous church in the background. From the buses coming up from the quay into the building, this truss is bridging over where the buses will uh, come out of the building as they drive through, creating a large opening for, for two buses to, to come out simultaneously. A view to the shopping center. Very industrial building and we, we wanted to keep it that way, but we still were controlling every track, cable colors, uh, beam colors, uh, the perforation of the roof uh, for acoustics. All of those things were things that we uh, controlled. Inside the bus, looking again towards the church before we were standing above, now we're below. The buses come in on this side and drive out the other side where the truss was, driving out on this side. This is uh, the view standing on the quay, uh, the ISBS zone where we can open this, uh, roll the sense back. You see it's on wheels and roll it back and allow people to use the entire space around the building. And here we see it from the other side of the water, almost invisible, which um, believe it or not, I actually enjoy. A very low structure um, into the city, creating a datum. And here's the detail from that facade. All right. Um, I had one more thing I wanted to show, but I see that the majority of people are going to leave in seven minutes. Um, what would you propose that I do? I think that we should open it up to questions and I will moderate those questions if uh, people want to ask them through the chat room. And then just because we talked about it yesterday and what I think would be great is if you would be willing to share your website so that we can talk about maybe the construction of that as a design uh, component sure. and also a way of leading to other projects that maybe you didn't get to today. Okay, good. Let's do it like that. Amber, can I ask the first question? Please. I don't have to type it in the chat room. <laughs> um, thanks for the talk, Gary. The work's beautiful. I really, in particular, appreciate the kind of contextual sensitivity without kind of deferring all of the aesthetic maneuvers to the context. Um, I wanted to come back to two things that you said early on, uh, um, and I hope that these can be answered quickly. I, I'm certain the first one can. can. Do you, are you still as aggressive, um, let's say now with getting clients as you were with Liebeskin and OMA in terms of getting that job? And then secondly, um, um, what, what you hinted that the, the book, the manifesto is about the ways in which the profession is changing and the role of the architect is changing. Can you maybe say something a bit more about that just in terms of how, how what you imagine the role of the architect becomes will affect our students today? Sure. Um... You know, one of the things, uh, first of all, to answer the first question, and it's not really an answer, but it's uh, honesty. We, um, you know, both of those office, particularly Libeskin, um, is very, is very top down. And one of the things that I think is kind of interesting, also in the future practice, and you see it more and more, you know, is that we create, and for me, our office is a, is a framework, and that framework allows for a lot of different types of people to, to operate in that framework. And one of the things that I'm doing more and more is curating it 
and meaning that when people come in and have certain agendas, ambitions, and things, I'm always looking for ways to moderate it, curate it, and uh, accelerate it, uh, because I think that's where the office, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the office gets much more interesting when it's kind of autocatalytic, and it's not always, the, the, the catalytic part is not always coming from just one point or one direction. Um, so for me, that's been a kind of big change, and that just gives you suddenly, you know, it really becomes atomic in its nature. For me, that's much more, you know, much more interesting that I'm, I'm in control in one way, but uh, ultimately not in control. Um, and I think uh, it's almost more interesting to let go of control than to obsess about control. Um, when it comes to the book, you know, like I said, one of the things that we found out, you know, we were literally signing contracts that said, you will only use our details, you will only use our material specification, you will only use, you know, the, the parameters we're getting smaller and smaller. We are suddenly understanding that, okay, we're not involved in the landscape park, that's someone else. We're not involved in the interiors, that's someone else. We're not involved in the lighting design, that's someone else. We're not, you know, we're getting involved in less and less parts of the building. And we're saying, well, that's just not kind of, you know, accept, you know acceptable for us. Um, so one of the things that we did was we did a stunt um, to test this kind of premise. And that stunt was that we, we saw a newspaper article, a big uh, hotel developer that we knew was looking to do a hotel on the other side of the country. We worked with them before. We designed a hotel, you can see on our website, called the Clarion Hotel. And we basically built a business case for that hotel, a business case that normally he would do himself, but we built it from an architectural perspective, from an urban perspective, from a value uh, perspective that was completely different than any of his analysis would have done. So Colliers International or like, uh, Deloitte, for example, they'll tell you, yes, there's a capacity. You can build 400 rooms. You can build a conference center of 1,500 seats. The city will allow that. You need so much parking. And they'll give you certain metrics, but they will not tell you what those metrics mean to everyday person. They will not tell you what those metrics means um, what those metrics mean to, uh, let's say, the uh, the longevity of the project? They were not. They're they're not going to actually delve into the realm that we're kind of unloaded with to try to make something successful. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to step it back and say, well, we're almost doing all that due diligence anyway. Why don't we do a little bit more due diligence and take that position as well? And what we said was, here's the whole project. We did it for free. We went to his office, presented it. He was kind of like, said, this has never happened to me before. And we said, we want 2% of the sale. If you don't sell it or if you don't have the purchase, if you don't purchase it, fine, we walk away, we're friends. If you purchase it, that 2% is a freaking lot of money for us, let's say. Um, way more than we would ever get in fees to do that kind of research. And so what it also allowed us to do is we started to sell our services differently. I was frankly tired of being a service provider. I was tired of someone coming to me and saying, draw this for me. Um, they already knew what they wanted. They knew exactly how they wanted it done. The more and more, I think one of the big differences is when we approach people, we're pretty straight from the beginning. We want to be partners. If we're not partners, then we're not interested. And we're willing to take certain loss, but we also are very willing to take certain upsides and we can generate revenue for you. And we've proven that. And we've, we have projects now where we, have the data to say, this is where you were, this is where you are now, this is the value that we created for you, this is how we created that value for you, and that's how we can create that value for you in other projects as well. And at the same time, we can do all of that with our own uh, agenda, which is to make equitable space you know, for people and to, and that's something, and to make space that is kind of environmentally intelligent, to make, um, uh, yeah, so for us, uh, that, that changing role became one where we started to bring those elements back together again uh, and reframing the, the, the profession. One where we started to, back to that diagram from deep, penetrating the other side of that line. And, um, and that meant penetrating the political sphere, that meant penetrating the investor sphere, penetrating the developer sphere, and basically not being a service provider for general contraction model. So that was one of the things, and that's one of the things the book kind of reflects on. But it also just talks about how we, the book also talks about how we um, are addressing public space, how we're addressing, um, let's say, 
certain uh, environmental issues and what our agenda is. Because, you know, more and more what we feel or what we find is that, you know, it used to be that you would brand yourself and you had a certain kind of aesthetic and people liked it or not. But, you know, people want to get behind something. People are looking more and more for a kind of activism, let's call it. And that kind of activism means that there's something that they kind of believe in. And I think our profession also has to offer something for people to get on board with and become, you know, become avid um, um, supporters of an idea or of an agenda. So that's where we're kind of shifting our focus. And it's been a three, four year process. Uh, there's some people, frankly, left the office and said, no, I just want to make cool buildings. Um, we're not interested in having in taking this fight. But what's kind of ironic now is during the times that we're in living in right now, people start to reassess their whole value system about where they're living, about their mobility, about public space, about uh, about many things, um, and the investments clients are making, etc. And and that's uh, so ironically enough, I think it's uh, particularly timely for us to to uh, to reassess uh, the role of the architect. Okay. Thank you. Um, I saw there was another question. Yes, there is another question. And I'll just read it out loud on behalf of Alexander. Um, with the building theme of uh, foot traffic re retaking cities from vehicular traffic, what do you feel are the limits of public spaces washing over and on top of roads? What is the in-between step for modern cities as we transition from urban sprawl to smaller, taller units with more walking and open spaces? And maybe, you know, do you feel that that's true? Uh, no, I mean, absolutely. Um, there's a project that we did some years ago, which was kind of overlooked until now, which is called Oslo Roadless, where we essentially redesigned and calculated all of the, all of this kind of um, residual space, traffic space, unused space, parking space in the city, and started to look at what would happen when we would get all of that content and, uh, and um, and rethink it. And uh, so the project's called Oslo Roadless. Uh, it was presented at a, a, at a conference. And um, no, and I, it was, a, it was let's say, a super great opportunity to look at that. The next project, if Alexander's staying, I was going to show deals exactly with that theme and that subject. Um, it is, um, it is, let's say what what that situation was kind of it's very interesting the amount of resistance to this movement is immense you know we were in uh, let's say essentially in court cases kind of defending the validity of the kind of premises that we're making about uh, mobility the project i'm going to show you next um, was a shopping uh, it was a large public it was a large parking lot um, which was the center square of the city um, flanked by a large shopping mall owned by one of the most powerful men in the country who was dependent on having those parking spaces, meaning dependent on bringing thousands of cars into the city. And we managed to build up a business case to eliminate them. So is it going in that direction? Yes. Do we know what to do with that space yet? No, I don't think enough people are looking at it. Um, it I think that what it does offer us um, you know, I think it offers us a, you know, a new perspective on public space. I think it will give us new ideas about uh, densifying space. We have another part of, um, we have another, we have another part of our office, uh, which was, uh, which is a separate company that we're developing, which is called Onfill. And Onfill is the opposite of infill or not the opposite, but the, let's say, the, uh, the sibling of infill, which means we've been obsessed with infill projects of how we can densify the ground area. And we're starting to look at by using uh, things like CLT construction, how we can build lightweight structures on top of existing structures in order to, in order to densi densify the city. So we have a kind of pilot project where we're looking at that in Stockholm, amongst other places, and here in Oslo as well, to see how these both the new technology where we can scan buildings, get precise models of 3D. We have a company that also deals with scanning buildings, getting precise 3D models of buildings and understanding their structures and translating that into uh, densification in terms of on-fill. So in, in between space, but also uh, the, so there's three things we're talking about, adaptive reuse, 
which is one of the, I think, basically 50% of what we're doing. Um, Oslo more or less doesn't need to or won't need to grow for a very long time um, if we reuse smartly the building mass that's already there. So that's adaptive reuse projects where architects can be incredibly important. And I don't think those should be all given to, and you're making a big mistake if you give all those projects over to interior architects. I think we have to bring them together and interior architecture and architecture are, let's say, kind of work together and look at this adaptive reuse. Then there's the on-field projects. And of course, there's the roads, the public spaces, the parking lots, and how we will uh, reuse those spaces and create public spaces and create densification as well. That's a great answer. Um, a more general question coming about the Teza Bazaar, um, asking about the historical context and how it informed your approach to the design, if it did. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that's always, you know, one of the things that's fascinating and one of the things that concerns me, the thing that concerns me is that despite what the client said, I think they want to make a shopping mall. And that kind of concerns me. One of the things that I find interesting in the bazaar, there is a, there is a kind of a structure or a way of working there that is largely not understandable for someone who just goes there. You know, if I go to one, you know, I, when I go to the Teze Bazaar, I'm constantly being followed around by people who are introducing me to their friend and their neighbor and the other people. So there is a network between all of these guys. At the same time, I'm completely fascinated to go there and find one guy is just selling, you know, a single bag of potatoes off the back of his truck. Um, and that's, you know, so he's driven probably, you, you know, driven, you know, a hundred kilometers to come and sell this bag of potatoes you know, where other people are pressing you, pressing fresh, uh, you know, gr uh, granata, uh, what are they called, granata eplet? Um, yeah, pressing, uh, sorry, I'm speaking in Norwegian now. So pressing fruit for you and, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. So there is, you know, but what really fascinated me, and it's a really good question because I really thought we were at like ground zero market. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then someone said, no, 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 no. This is like, and it looks really rough inside and you saw the pictures are quite rough. They said, no, 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 this is the most luxurious market in the city. But actually, if you drive just to the outskirts of the city, that's the distribution center. And that's a market that goes several kilometers in every direction. Um, and it is just an endless, covered by, it's a one story building covered by a metal roof in several kilometers. And that's where all the food comes into the city. What's insanely fascinating there, you know, and when I'm staying there and going out and eating, for instance, is you don't find mangoes, you don't find avocados, you don't find anything except exactly what they're growing there. And basically every restaurant you go to is serving the same amazing food with these traditional recipes and everything that you're eating is local. So this, uh, so there is this, so it's exactly what we've all dreamed about as architects, this kind of, uh, let's say short traveling food, because what you're eating there is exactly what they're growing there. And there's a direct relationship between the city and, and the farms. And that for me was uh, incredibly fascinating. And when you're going, when you really go out and see where the food is coming in and the vastness of it and the quality of it uh, was, was kind of mind blowing. So it really, I mean, that project is just kind of a great project. I don't know if it will end up great when I, uh, uh, it's always hard to say. We delivered a project which we will not probably continue or only in a limited amount. So it's hard to say, but number one, understanding their history. I visited all of the markets around town. Um, and this was definitely after I understood it was the most fancy and expensive one. So only people with quite a lot of money and that was probably attributed to the high rise buildings that came there and the possibility of getting higher prices for the same goods. You, know, you could get the same goods for a half or a third or a quarter of the price if you went just slightly uh, outside the city um, at different markets. So in general, understanding, I mean, it took me a long time to understand the mechanics of the culture, to understand the market and the idea of distribution and resale um, but also understanding just the, the, the culture and history of markets um, there in that region. So it was a, 
Yeah, we did a really big investigation on that and that was driving the project uh, quite heavily. And, the, and at the same time, like I said, the neighborhood Kabinka, which is right next to us, is a really beautiful, really textured, colorful neighborhood, um, but also a very low income neighborhood. And part of our design was also how to meet those people so that they don't become excluded um, when they redesign the market and it becomes expensive and the prices get jacked up and essentially they create front doors and gates for the building. So we were really trying to make the market an extension of the city. That's great. Um, we're well over time, but I do have one last question to close this out. And it's, um, I don't know, like a kind of tongue in cheek one, which is why do you think you weren't supposed to talk about the book today? Um, yeah, good question. Michael, Michael, um, number one, he said this format kind of lends itself more to, um, more to, uh, uh, let's say beautiful stuff than long, uh, long, uh, long theoretical lectures. So he was kind of, uh, really wanted to more so for the, for the format. Uh, that was one thing. Um, and as you know, Michael has a beautiful lecture. I mean, he's a good friend of mine and I admire him a lot. He has a very good lecture where he talks about the shift from um, from theory, let's say in the let's say 90s and early, let's say early 90s, and how that's shifted to um, in the 2000s and how the practice changed. And there's much more what he calls design intelligence. And he kind of he tracks the history from a theoretical profession to this design intelligence profession in a beautiful article. If you guys haven't found it find it, uh, it's really great. Um, and so I think also it reflects a little bit his uh, idea about um, design and technology um, and the tools that we have. So I think he wanted to see, he said a lot of, the reason I told my personal story and the reason I showed the kind of work I showed with the number one show a bit our value set to show where I, let's say how I came to, to where I am now, but also he just said just to make the profession accessible. And he really wants to make uh, architecture accessible. How do you make this transition to, let's say, yeah, how do you make this transition? You know, my son just graduated from college and is kind of completely confused. Uh, let's say, uh, how do you make the transition from academics to post-academic? So uh, that, was his, that was, let's say, I think the motivation of the talk that we had yesterday, and that's why I changed the, the lecture. Uh, the presentation well, I appreciate that you showed so much beautiful work, um, and I am sure that students do too. And uh, I hope that they will follow up by visiting your website, seeing the other great work that you've done. Um, so thank cool. you for lecturing. You're welcome. So that's it. We're, we're, I'm, I'm, I, can, if, I can entertain more, but if everyone has to go, then I'm happy to go. Um, I think at this point, most people are probably needing to make their way towards studio. Um, okay. And so uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So um, right, great. I think, yeah, you've done a great job today. Thank you so much.